This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm very pleased to bring you a conversation with the great Jim Ward from At The Drive-In and Sparta. The catalyst for our chat is due to an Australian tour that is happening in May of 2024. Sparta will be performing Wiretap Scars. I believe they're playing the album in full and other classics from the group. Um, for the smart asses out there, yes, throughout the conversation, I call the album Wire Trap Scars. Sometimes that just happens. I did it with the Carcass album too. Anywho, this is a classic conversation, I've got to say, because I was finally able to ask Jim about what his recollections were of the performance by At The Drive-In at the Australian Big Day Out Festival in 2001. That's that infamous bloody festival that that young lady passed away. She died. In 2001, whilst Lid Biscuit were performing well, at the drive-in had a lot to say about crowd behaviour before that, when they refused to play it unless people settled down. So have a listen to what Jim has to say about that. Yeah, we talk about a lot about at the drive-in. They are one of my favourite bands, so there's a number of topics raised. And of course, we do talk about Sparta as well, but... This is one of those chats that I've been looking forward to having for some time. Jim is the musical architect behind both bands, so it was quite special that I saw him appear on the on email and he was available for a chat. So here he is, it's Jim Ward from Sparta and at the drive-in. Hello. Jim, how's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, not too bad, mate. How the, uh, how's the old Zuma grind treating you? Ah, oh, it's okay. <laughs> couple of days, couple of hours, it's all right. Oh, it got to be done, hasn't it, mate? You know, you're obviously where there's quite a lot of interest in the tour and any new in general, mate, given your uh, your long history with both Sparta and uh, at the drive-in as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm uh, I'm fortunate to have friends and fans in Australia that I can't wait to see. So, No, that's great. So, so just on the tour, I guess I've already mentioned the first question there, but... Uh, promoters don't reach out to you and ask say to you hey we want to bring you down here unless there's interest so have you have you been getting a lot of mail from us over the years yeah yeah absolutely i mean i think my first experience in australia was that that 2001 big day out with at the drive-in and and kind of set the stage for you know 20 plus years of coming and going i've done solo tours there i've had just a ton of fun played little tiny cities with just an acoustic guitar taking trains around like you know, it's just a great place to explore. I think the people are are so genuinely happy if you make the effort to come down. Obviously, mm-hmm. you guys are fucking far away from us, but um, if we make the effort, it seems like it's it's just returned tenfold. Um, I have some great friends there that that I've made over the years, and um, yeah, I can't, I you know, I can't wait to get back. And this this record's pretty special. Uh, in relation to to you know being being on the 2003 big day out and playing it for the first time mm. um to huge crowds and and sort of learning how to do this job coming from just being a guitar player backup singer to sort of being the front man um yeah. you know it's just it's a it's a country that's so supportive and kind um and just ready for a good time it's like a great mix of of a uh, of energy yeah cool yeah hey were, were the the tunes the cuts on Y trap scars were they was the majority of the music, so it might not have been completely assembled, but was a lot of that composed in preparation for at the driving? The only one that I that I know for sure was was written before um, was air because there's video of me playing it. I don't know at the driving show in between songs, like playing the riff. Mm. So I clearly was working on it, um, but for me. You know, especially at that time, I was just a riff writer. So I would go into practice with riffs. I didn't necessarily make full songs um, because most of the writing, um, obviously all the lyrics and, and vocal lines and at the drive-in are, are, were Cedric. And he was kind of yeah. the guy that I wrote with at practice. Um, so it'd usually be a mishmash of our of our ideas. Um, so going into this, it was pretty much the same thing. I just kind of walked in with a bunch of riffs and, you know, everybody put put their two cents in and we started crafting songs out of it but i was you know i feel like it took me a long time to to be a songwriter and it's kind of like my favorite part of this this musical life is that journey yeah i can understand that yeah 
What what you mentioned the the two th- I, I kept my memory you know I'm 45 so I distinctly recall uh, what went on in the uh, your your performance on the big day mm-hmm. out but nobody had a better view to what was going on than you you were on stage yeah. with the band what do you remember Are you talking about the Sydney show without the driver Yeah yeah for sure yeah sorry the yeah, yeah. that one uh, yeah. No no I know and I was telling somebody today. Um, I was telling somebody today that that's like one of the most famous at the drive-in shows and the and one of the weirdest. You know, the thing is, and I remember I was just doing an interview talking about it a minute ago. I remember everything from that day. I remember uh, the band next to us encouraging their crowd to come over because it was one of those big hangers where the stages yeah. are next to each other. Mm. And and I know they meant it. They meant no harm by it. They were just telling, like they were excited to see us or they're telling the crowd to come and see us. And, and we had this sort of uh, hype around us or whatever. Um, but what I saw was just pure violence. I just saw people wailing on each other and and people that were using music as an excuse to to get their way. And I was, you know, we were horrified by it. And we kept saying, if you don't get your shit together, we're out of here. And nobody didn't seem like they believed us. So we left. And unfortunately, the only ones that really suffered were were the people that were there to see us. It wasn't the the sort of, you know, you got to remember, this is like 99 Woodstock era of just like, no, no, yeah. Yeah, it feels like like white male rage, and I I don't want to be a part of that. Like I don't want to, I don't want to be the soundtrack to that. And so we chose not to. And obviously, you know, tragically, we saw what bands do want to be part of that, and what happened, and it's unfortunate. So, just not our thing. And and that day was, you know, Cedric made the right call. We all had his back. It was like we're not going to be a part of this. We're not, you know, for it's like when a band is getting big that comes from where we came from yeah we didn't even bending to those rules like if you want us here you're gonna have to play by our rules um and so that's what we did those are our rules if you can't be cool then we're fucking out of here so i commend you guys for it actually because i thought the big day outs were full of shit too i gotta say and you saw that and you experienced that and i'm, a, I'm an old school black and death metal fan i've got to say so hey can you still hear me or is it cut out a bit Uh, just cutting out. I just didn't want you to miss this, what I was saying, that's all. Go on, you froze. Oh, there we go. Is it working now? Yeah, you're back. Okay, sweet. Yeah, Here we yeah. go. I comm- I, what I was saying was I commend you guys for doing what you did, I, I have to say. Um, and I know very few people at the time did. And I'm an old school death and black metal fan, man. So been at tons of shows. But one of the key things in that scene is there's, I feel like as though there's always been mutual respect. Someone falls over, you pick them yep. up, this sort of thing. Yep. Um, whereas with that, Limp biscuit mud vein thing, and I'm pretty sure could be wrong. I'm sure, it was mud vein that were playing on the stage. It was. Okay, and you even you saw it in the fans back then. They were hyper. They were aggressive. They were thugs. A lot of them, yep. and yep. we saw tragically what it led to. The organisers had their hands tied behind their back. People have tried to throw the organisers under the bus, but the big day out for the era were with just you had a lot of that. You call it bro culture or whatever it was. But there's a lot yeah, of that yeah. shit that was going on there that, thank God, it's disappeared. And a lot of the youth that go to gigs now doesn't happen now, okay? But we yeah. both remember it going on back then. So, yeah, it was it was great to get your your take all these years later, 22, is it, 23? <laughs> 23, 23 yeah, years later. Like Feels like yesterday, but there you go. It does. Yeah, for sure. It was a wild moment. And, you know, we got... We got thoroughly chewed out in the dressing room by the by the promoters saying that it was our fault for not having a light show and and that we you know because when we walked off it went fucking bonkers right like our crews getting yeah. pegged with shit and people were yelling and booing and whatever but you know we stuck to our guns and said look this is the way we believe a community runs and we're not going to be a part of it and if that means you're kicking us off then you know fuck off if that's it you know and then of course what happened happened and then we got a huge apology from them a few days later um and said yeah you you guys were right and of course we were right there's no place for that in our culture there's just not you you guys saw what it was it was prescient and it was eerily prescient i've got to say yeah yeah. yeah, you guys but you guys saw exactly what was going on and were the only band it had been going on for a while right you guys were the Mm -hmm. only bands to actually call that shit out from stage you know that we and and i'll tell you why like you said we're on stage we can see everything we were watching the kids that came to see us which you know back in the day are like small you know punk kids these are not bros these are not fucking jocks or whatever i mean you can be a jock and love this music what i'm saying there there was not like a big massive amount of like tough guys in the front row it was all these like small people kids 
like trying to watch a band that they had heard about it was the first time we're coming and we were watching them just get beat to shit and like i don't want to be a part of that there's no there's no good feeling that's happening as a as a musician for me watching that it, it wasn't a punk show it was a thug fest you know I, I can't. I'm venting my opinions now, so bear with me for a moment. I just can't believe that people still listen to that shit, Mudvayne and um, Limp Biscuit. They just came yeah. through. They fucking just came through town, you know, and they yeah. sold out. I just look at people and I just shake my head at them. It's insane. There's like younger punk bands that listen to them like almost ironically, and I'm I'm so <laughs> confused by it because you know, aside from just like the personal politics of it, like just not not my thing like you know maybe cool riffs or whatever but like the subject matter is you know just fucking dumb but that's me that's my opinion uh, it's it's honestly it's the very w- worst aspect of rock and roll uh, in the western hemisphere i'll yeah. say it it is what yeah. it is you see this shit yeah. and you just go who buys this shit there must be tons of people i don't know any of them <laughs> you don't know yeah. any of them. <laughs> I know, right? it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy well Oh well. Hopefully what a, they uh, hopefully they find a good path. You know, we'll yeah. we'll keep we'll keep them in our thoughts. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Are you um? I know you weren't there for Interalia, but were you? Are you still mates with Cedric and Doma? We, you know, it's one of those things. Like our relationships kind of are circular. So sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. And mm. I just, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's, uh, you know, I love. I love those guys, and sometimes it's best to not be around each other. That's it. <laughs> I made a deal with myself 25 years ago that I would never talk shit about anybody in the press, and and I still stick to that this day. And, you know, sometimes the easiest thing is to just say that this is a very complicated relationship. And, um, you know, I've always chosen to, to, to just sort of see the positive and stuff. I started that band when I was 17. I love that band. Uh, it was a bummer to be removed from it at that point. But at the same time, there's, you know, I always say there's a lot of alphas in that band. There's a lot of opinions. And, you know, one of the things about being in a band is this is part of the job. Sometimes you don't fit in. Sometimes you got to go. And I've been on both sides of that. And neither one is fun. I hate kicking people out. But sometimes it's just what has to happen for for the uh, for the band to keep going or whatever it is. and. You know, the only thing that bums me out is that that it was alluded to by I don't know who in the press or whatever that had to do with some sort of argument about money. And I would say strictly 100 percent. That's not true. And it's never had anything to do with money. It's not about, uh, you know, who had more say or who was in control. It's just it's just being in a band. You know what I mean? Like sometimes, you know, you're just not meant to be on that shit. And that's it. Whatever. It is what it is. Mm. Look, why tra- why trap scars is a classic in its own right. Okay, um, did you know you had that in you when you were in at the driving though? No way, man. No, I don't. All this stuff is uh, as shocking to me as it is to anybody else. Like when at the driving started getting big, I was more shocked than anybody out there, um, because it's not. It wasn't our plan. That wasn't the program. I never gave a shit about that. I was telling someone today at lunch, like. I'm one of the few people that that joined a band that didn't join to get a girl. You know, like that was ne- I, that stuff like fame and fortune and, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll. Like the only part I'm interested in is the rock and roll. Like I don't give a shit about the other stuff. So, yeah, I'm as shocked as everybody else when when there's some sort of success. So, no, I didn't. I had no idea. And and I know that that we put in the work. And that's the only thing I can equate it to is that when when it comes time to just sort of be. A blue collar band working, we do that, and and that's what I still love to do to this day. I don't I don't care about the other stuff at all. Mm, yeah. Well, what what would you say when you reflect over both tenures? Um, maintaining a career in in the music industry is challenging at the best of times. You literally are the one percent of the one percent if you've managed to make a career yeah. out of it. So, what would you suggest would be one of the more challenging things that you've had to deal with in all that time? Um, <clears throat> it's a really good question. I think for me, the, the biggest challenge has been the mental health aspect of it. And that's something that we didn't talk about 20 years ago. And, and I, you know, I left the only time I've ever canceled shows in my life. I left a tour in 2004, um, because I was so down and so depressed that I didn't understand 
none of that stuff was ever talked about. And you're sort of like, Hey, you're so lucky you get to do this. Like you don't ever want to complain. You don't ever want to say like, I'm tired. You don't ever want to say no to anything because you think not, you think you're told by the people around you that if you say no, you're going to ruin everybody's career. You're going to ruin everybody's life. You're going to, everyone's going to be homeless because you didn't take the tour that that was offered to you. And there's a crazy pressure that comes with this stuff that when you're a young, young person and you're kind of getting fed, you know, like if you're upset, someone just gives you a bottle of whiskey and, and thinks that that's going to yeah. fix it because all you do is numb yourself. And then you're like, fine, I'll do this tour. I'll do this. I'll, you know, sure. I'll spend, you know, in the year 2000, I was home 21 days. That's fucking inhuman. That's mm -hmm. insane. And all of that stuff uh, becomes the biggest challenge. So I've made a career of walking away. You know, I walk away all the time. I stop doing it all the time. Um, I don't care about the momentum. I don't care about the next step in the career or whatever I'm supposed to care about. Like none of that stuff's important to me. You know, what's important is that I do the best job of of being part of my family. And, and that includes the band, but it also includes my family at home. And, um, I'm tired of those cliches. I'm tired of, you know, owning a house and never seeing it. Like, it's just like, I want to enjoy my life, you yeah. know, and I want to still make music. And and there's a point where making music becomes a job that you don't want to have. And that's the worst because this has always been like the greatest love of my life, you know? And, and when it sucks, it's like the most painful thing. So I just, a long time ago, I just started stopping and I learned the power of saying no. And yes, I could be more famous and I could be richer and our band could be bigger and we could sell more. All of that stuff would probably be true if I followed certain guidelines or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, I was like, I want to go home and and open a bar. I just want to be I just want to go to work every day at a bar. And so I did that for a long time and it was awesome, you know. And then I was like, man, I really want to go on tour. So I go on tour and then, you know, just trying to enjoy things. and. Um, yeah, we're, we could be bigger, but I don't care. Mm. You guys are from New, New Mexico from memory. Is that correct? Is that you born and raised there? Texas. Texas. Yeah, West Texas. Okay. Did that? Yeah. But did, very close. I mean, I lived five minutes from New Mexico. So we, we, I always got the impression that you guys were outsiders amongst outsiders too, meaning that you stood out and you were very independent. And I, I think what you're saying there certifies that, but did you find that with with your career in the industry, particularly without the drive-in, it happened slowly, slowly, and then just went boom rapidly, like people just all of a sudden got you guys, even though you guys understood what yeah. you were doing right from the start? Yeah, we call it the seven-year overnight success story. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's all of this stuff I understand now. At the time, I don't think I did, but obviously I'm 47 and I've lived through it, and and I'm older than the people that were looking after us now. So I have I have wisdom beyond the years that I did then. And I can see it differently. And there's things that I appreciate about it that I didn't appreciate at the time. And there's stuff that I can't believe we went along with. Um, but all of it is like a learning, a learning curve. And, you know, it's like, I, I used to love that quote from the Beatles. And I don't know who said it, but, you know, we used to fight about music. And then we started fighting about money. There's a point where fighting about music is fine. You know, like that, that's what we should be doing is trying to make the best stuff that we can make. Um, mm. All the other shit is is superfluous and it's not interesting to me. And if you're not good at that stuff, there's going to be a consequence to it. And and the consequence for that band is that we we imploded. The consequence for this band is that I stop and I start and I stop and I start. And so there's always going to be a consequence. But learning those kind of like <clears throat> you don't have to do something lessons is important. Hmm. So what on, on that point, what would you say is the most has been and continues to be potentially the most fulfilling aspect of your career? So to me, the, the fortunate part about what I do is that people allow our music into their life and then it becomes part of their life and it becomes theirs. And the ownership changes from from me to them. And to play a show, especially on this tour where we're playing this, we play the record straight through without talking. Um, and to watch people get lost in their memories and their emotions. I mean, just literally watching people sob while we play because they're they're reliving something that this record is tied to. Um, that's the most incredible feeling. And it's selfish, right? Because, you know, everybody likes to be the, you know, the nice guy. 
like it's it's selfish because it's it's like volunteering is such a selfish thing because it makes you feel good right it's it's a weird it's a weird thing i don't know how to explain it but no i get it um, it's the thing about giving i feel like we're so lucky yeah yeah and i and you know sometimes i use the word luck and it's really not not lucky we worked hard and we're fortunate um we're fortunate because for some reason like the one percent of the one percent we have have been able to do this and the only reason we get to do this is because of fans like if there weren't fans then we would not be doing this it's a simple simple thing and you know i try and remember that at every show and and be as honest as i can it doesn't mean that you're in the best mood every day and and sometimes i tell the crowd like man i had the worst day and and i'm fighting through this to try and um make sure that we're all going to have a good time tonight and usually i'm uplifted a thousand times by that by by saying that and people saying like yeah we're all we're all here there's this like energy there's this like positivity there's this amazing um community and when you get to be a part of that community it's it's a it's a real a very fortunate feeling and 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 humbling you know what i mean like the fact that people in Australia own music that I made and actually want us to come and are paying money to see us is still mind blowing to me 27 mm. years into this career. You know, it's yeah. fucking crazy. I, I, I feel this way. So talking about it from, this is my opinion. I feel like why Trap Scars is, is a natural successor to Relationship of Command. What are your thoughts? I think that if you took all the music that was made by all the members and put it in a blender, that it was all on the same, you know, that stuff was, that stuff was in all of us. And, you know, the one thing that I always, um, I think there was a part of me that always hoped that we would come back and make more stuff. Um, and I think I realized at some point that that, that chemically wasn't going to be like it would, we can make stuff together for sure, but it, it shouldn't be under that moniker because it was such a time specific part of the equation. Like that age, that innocence, that fervor of, of wanting to see the world, um, all of that was part of what was happening. So as far as like writing riffs, yeah, it's to me, it's a natural successor because that's what I was, that's where I was headed. And then Obviously, you know, I've I've made lots of different records over the years, including stuff that sort of slides in the country. And, yeah. and all of those things are parts of me. But honestly, all of it is like, I'm just trying to write a good song. That's at the end of the day, that's all I want to do is, is keep trying to write the best song. That's it. That's really the only thing that's important to me in, in music is like, I, I could give a shit less about gold records or fucking Grammys or whatever. None of that means anything to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to write a better song. Yeah, well, I, I'd certainly think uh, Relationship of Command should have been up there. There's no doubt about that. For for a very, for about six months there, you guys were the center of the musical universe. You must have felt, a, a, you must have felt something similar to that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's like, that's the crushing feeling of, <laughs> of everybody's mm -hmm. expectations. And, um, you know, I think I was kind of in the middle of it. You know, I wasn't the most recognized member and I wasn't the least recognized member. I was like probably right in the middle. Mm. Um, I wasn't the, I definitely had no interest in, in, in being famous, but, but I was definitely enjoying the bigger shows and getting to go to more countries. And then there was a point where it was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is not fun at all. Um, and this is like watching my friends suffer is not fun like it's not an easy thing to go through and and you know we could have made it and we could have been a probably a huge band um but i'm kind of kind of stoked that it went the way it went i wouldn't change anything to be honest with you i would i would i love that that's where it's left so for me that band ends that day in holland and you know i've done reunion stuff and i've not done reunion stuff and mm. i still my my opinion would be it should have stopped in in Groningen like it did. No, I, I agree with you totally. I, I did a review for Interalia and your 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 uh, absence is, as I say, keenly felt or you were missed. Yeah, I, appreciate, but, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't think it was quite there, unfortunately, but they, you got to try these things. Nobody begrudges the guys, I don't think, who's a fan anyway. But but yeah, just talk, good. Yeah, just talking about influences quickly for you, I, I hear a bit of Gang and Four, this sort of thing. Is that the case with your guitar playing or? 
it's super funny. I'm going to tell you a funny gang of four stories. So I was at, uh, we were playing, I want to say the first Coachella. So this is like probably 99, somewhere around mm-hmm. there, 99, 2000. Um, and I was at, I used to, I didn't live in LA, so I would hang out at the Troubadour all the time. That was like my bar. So um, everybody else lived in LA. I didn't, I would fly out. I would stay in a hotel or whatever it was. And But my local watering hole was a Troubadour. They would let me in no matter what show it was. And I would just sit at the bar and hang out with the bartenders and whatever. And I was sitting next to a guy and we sort of struck up a conversation and, and, you know, I was, you know, he was there managing a band and, and all of this led to like, he's like, oh, you know, I was in a band in, you know, in, in the seventies or whatever. And, and I was like, oh, cool. What band? And I said, oh, I was the drummer in Gang of Four. And I was like, never heard of you. I'd never heard of Gang of Four. It was just one of those things that you miss, right? Like I just missed that band for yeah. whatever reason. And then afterwards, when I went to like practice or whatever, I was telling the dudes, I was like, yeah, I met the, you know, the drummer from Gang of Four. And I, you know, I, I don't know who that, and Cedric was like, what? You met this, like, he was, <laughs> he would have been the perfect person to be there because he would have asked a thousand questions. And I was just like, man, I don't, yeah, I, I miss that. But of course, since then, um, you know, become a huge fan, obviously, because I was like, what am I missing? And then you get the records and and you sort of realize that, you can't own every record. You can't be the dude that knows everything. Right. And, and he was really gracious and super cool. And, um, we still had a great conversation, but I, I love, I love that story because yeah, zero influence on me. Um, up until I was 20, 23 years old. Yeah. So what was it, was it more obvious? Was it like JK Lee and those sort of players? Was it? It's, you know, I, I came from the very, um, like discord family of, of music. Uh, so like Fugazi and, and rights of spring. And those are kind of my, those were my bands. Those are the ones that I listened to growing up. Drive like Jehu was a huge band for me. I probably have stolen more drive like Jehu riffs than, <laughs> than I should have. Um, but I got to interview Rick, uh, before he passed away and I got to apologize and thank him for letting me steal his shit. So he said it was all good. So I, I have a clear conscience. <laughs> Killer mate. All right. I'll, uh, oh, how are you resting up actually with your, with your arm, your shoulder? Yeah, I'm good. It's just, you know, sometimes the universe tells you to take 12 weeks off. So that's what I'll do. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good way, a great way of looking at it. That's a fantastic way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah what are you going to do? You know? Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, uh, I won't give it the kiss of death, but it's my intention to be in the show, the crowd in the show when you come to Brisbane. Okay. So uh, that's what Perfect, I'll try man. to do. Every time I say that, I've got the kids have got a, a stead foot on or something like that. So yeah. I end up not well, being able to, to see you there. Yeah. Thanks for the chat. It's been great. Yeah. yeah, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, mate. Have a good one. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Catch ya. Thanks for listening to that chat featuring Jim Ward from At The Drive-In and Sparta. The tour dates for the May 2024 shows from Sparta are in the episode description. If you are local, maybe you want to head out. If you're going to the Brisbane show, let me know. All right, there's some more information to share with you about the book that I have written, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond to share with you in the moment but before we get to that i'll bid you a fond farewell my name is andrew mckay smith and i'm the host of the scars and guitars podcast until next time it's a goodbye for now this is eric rutan of cannibal corpse you are listening to the scars and guitars podcast with andrew mckay smith i've been the host of the scars and guitars podcast since 2017 the first musician i interviewed for the show was david vincent from morbid angel and things have just snowballed from there In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the the fans and the staying power of the... 
of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>